Good morning all. Um, I want to commence today by talking about a little bit about human vision. Um, these are iconic pictures which all of you have seen before and uh, then about uh, a little bit about what goes on in your own personal imaging devices. So here plenty of pictures um, um, from Wikipedia. Um, most of those pictures you will have seen before. Um, this is a reminder. Um, so one thing that I always need to remind myself actively of is that a perception that includes vision is not um, an objective uh, recording or rendering of what's going on uh, in our environment, uh, but it is something constructed. And um, a very um, striking proof of that, I think, is that um, as you look at your screen now, um, you're probably not aware of, of a dot this size, uh, which is black, right? You, you don't, uh, hopefully, most of you don't see a black dot this size in wherever you're looking at right now. Um, and yet, um, physiologically speaking, um, that's what we should see, because uh, we all have a blind spot in, in our eyes. If you look at the eye, um, there is uh, this uh, place where the optic nerve leaves the eye, and in this area um, there are no photoreceptors whatsoever. So by construction we have a blind area here, and our brain, well, it's, it's a combination of um, the scanning motions of our eyes and uh, the in-painting uh, algorithms of our brain. Um, they make us believe that we do see the complete picture all of the time, which is, however, not true. So what we do have is um, so-called saccades. So even if we believe that we are calmly staring at a scene, in reality, our eyes are darting around, making these tiny movements and revisiting um, the, um, the foci of interest. Um, and also, we usually, well, we have this impression of having a super high resolution recording of the environment. And that also is not true. Um, the super high resolution we get only in uh, this foveal area, shown here, um, where um, there's the greatest density of uh, photoreceptors. And uh, so we are using an, an attention mechanism to um, jump around um, to bring um, the points of potential interest into the visible area that, that this uh, fovea sees. And uh, of all of this, we are we're not aware of it, usually, when we just look at a scene. All right. Um, then, uh, as you know, in the retina, um, we have rods and cones. Um, the rods are uh, way more light sensitive, and uh, we have uh, way more of them altogether. And then we have uh, cones that are um, sensitive in the red-green, or mainly in the red-green and blue part of the, the spectrum. And, and so we have to realize that if, if we look at an image, the physical reality is that uh, we have two spatial dimensions, uh, I'm calling them x and y. Um, and then we have a complete, so even if the observer is completely static, even if the scene is completely static, and even if the illumination source is uh, completely static, um, we have, of course, a complete optical spectrum in each pixel. So if we take a single pixel here and uh, ask um, for you know, how much energy is there as a, as a function of wavelength, and in that single pixel, we may have a more or less uh, complicated spectrum. Um, and some animals, um, so for example, um, some of um, the um, oh, 
uh, crustacea, so, so flusskrebse in, in German, uh, that live in rivers, um, they have uh, 12 distinct receptors for color vision. So um, think that they sample the spectrum here with a, a total of 12 basis functions. Um, and um, as humans, um, we have these three basis functions. So even if the spectrum is uh, complicated, and for example, um, the spectrum of an old-fashioned light bulb, you know, a black body radiator would be a fairly smooth business. Um, if you look at the spectrum of um, <clears throat> Um, uh, these uh, recandescent light bulbs, uh, neon röhren in German. Um, if you look at, uh, uh, at their spectrum, uh, it's actually uh, extremely peaked because we have these lines where um, the, the gas in these incandescent bulbs uh, emits. Um, and uh, yet, if these are cleverly constructed, um, we don't really see the difference, at least not in terms of color, uh, because you see that um, these uh, cones here, um, they have a fairly broad absorption spectrum. Um, so what matters is, um, for example, for the green cone, um, the, the integral um, or the, the weighted sum of the energy that, that it sees, but it cannot really, uh, as long as this weighted sum is equal, a green cone will not be able to distinguish um, um, the fine uh, spectral details. Now actually, um, because we have um, three types of cones and the rods, um, you could argue that uh, we should be able to have a um, color space spanned by four points, so a 3D color space. Um, but it so turns out that uh, at least uh, the way that most uh, eyes and brains uh, in humans are wired up, we actually seem to use only the cones um, for um, informing our impression of color. Um, occasionally, um, there are people, um, um, it's more prevalent amongst women, um, who do have a fourth color cone or um, photoreceptor with a fourth um, kind of sensitivity. Um, however, um, even most of those people actually only experience um, three distinct or fundamental colors. And uh, so far, I think in, uh, in science, there's only evidence of a single human uh, that has been found uh, a lady who actually has a richer color vision, so who, um, who has the fourth color cone and her brain processes, uh, or her retinal brain uh, processes that information accordingly. So for most of us, um, we have these um, three color cones, um, and uh, these can uh, express color plus overall brightness, and well with uh, you know, with three points, you can span a, a two-dimensional plane. Um, hence, we have these, um, these uh, color spaces, uh, pictures that you will have seen before. Um, they were constructed in the 30s based on a tiny sample of um, white males from southern England, I believe. So it's not really very representative for what all of mankind feels or experiences, but it seems to do a you know, good enough job. So this, is, um, this has led to the creation of standards that are used um, to this day. Now, um, now it, in the, back then, you know, lasers were not easily available. Nowadays, as you know, if we, if we have a laser, um, ideally it will um, have a single wavelength only. And as we now um, tune our laser, um, so that uh, um, the, uh, it goes from low frequencies to high frequencies, um, from uh, infrared via red to blue to ultraviolet. Um, as we scan such a single frequency, um, we walk along the outside of this horseshoe. Okay, so um, uh, long wavelength 
um, we start here. And then for shorter and shorter wavelengths, we eventually uh, make our way there. So the outside of this horseshoe, um, this is the, the gamut of human vision, or the, these are the colors that we experience as we scan a single frequency, as we sweep a single frequency across the spectrum. Um, now, all other colors are convex combinations. Yeah? So uh, let's say um, if I have a spectral source uh, that looks like this, well, then this is going to be um, the convex combination of these three points. So it means I'm going to lie. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lie um, somewhere inside um, this triangle, and this color would look orangey, pinkish, uh, something like that. Okay. Um, here in the uh, bottom right corner, you see the so-called MacAdam ellipses. Um, these are um, here, um, you know, drawn on an arbitrary scale, and that shows the um, human sensitivity. Um, so for, um, or let's say, regions of uncertainty, and these ellipses here are exaggerated a little bit in size. So for example, um, we are pretty good at distinguishing um, slight changes in blue. Um, but um, we are not very good at distinguishing. Um, mm, okay, I'm not happy with my explanation because if you look at the um, if you look at the wavelength, then uh, well, this is stretched out here. So we see how in these in this representation. Um, how good humans are at, at distinguishing different colors. And, well, there are many reasons why, if you look at a photograph, why it doesn't look quite like the real thing. And um, I want to, well, point out two of these reasons. Um, one reason is that um, both your camera and your monitor, your screen, um, they only use um, three fundamental colors. Um, for example, these three colors. And so we can represent only whatever lies in this triangle. So let's say that your computer screen uh, realizes uh, these three points, um, then everything outside here is a color experience that exists in nature, but that your screen is not able to render to you simply because, well, those three points are the most extreme colors that your screen can produce. And then, uh, well, in uh, in, this, in the kind of hardware that uh, professionals use, both for image acquisition and for rendering, um, you can then have uh, primaries that are a bit further apart um, to capture more of the colors. Or what you see here, um, there is something actually with four edges, not with three. Um, this is a printing process, um, CMYK, so that's a cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And uh, with these taken together, you can um, well create a gamut that is, that is a little bit larger than if you use just three of those colors. Good, so this is one reason why pictures look different. Um, and the other reason is simply that um, actually our um, visual acuity that, that we have when we look at things um, is very high. So our, our eye is by no means a perfect camera, but um, we have about uh, 6 million uh, cones concentrated in this uh, area of the Fovea. And uh, so it means we have uh, you know, a 6 megapixel sensor here uh, that uh, subtends only a very small angle. Yeah, so if you, if you translate this, um, to the image, it means that where we do foveate, 
the point that, that we do look at closely, there we have an amazingly high resolution. And uh, better than what you get even, well, better than what you get with uh, cameras that, that have, you know, homogeneous resolution throughout the image and better than you get with uh, corresponding displays. Um, and so, for example, um, you remember the days when there used to be snow um, and when there was a sunny day, then by human eye, you can see these tiny uh, glitters. You can see the sun uh, reflected in, in single, uh, well, s crystals or snowflakes lying on the ground. Um, and if you move your head ever so slightly, then you know they sparkle and go on and off, uh, depending on uh, you know just following the, the laws of refraction. Um, and if you take a picture of that, uh, you know it might be pretty, but it's not the same thing, simply because you cannot carry that amount of, of resolution. All right, these um, the photoreceptors themselves. Um, uh, so this relies on membrane-bound proteins and uh, this is why in a single rod or in a single cone we have these uh, membrane stacks here. Um, the, they have the sole purpose of um, creating or of increasing the surface area so as to accommodate um, more of these uh, photosensitive proteins and these are um, you know quite amazing uh, feats of uh, engineering. Um, and then you, you've also seen, you know, this picture, this is a, as a reminder, um, a histogram, where are the rods and where are the cones? So in this uh, fovea, this uh, area of uh, greatest acuity, um, we have only cones. They give us color vision, but they need a lot of light. And uh, elsewhere we have rods, very many of them. Uh, 20 times more. Um, they can uh, do with much less light, uh, but don't give us color vision. And again, notice uh, this is the, black, black, the blind spot I was talking about. So where the optic nerve exits the eye, we see strictly nothing. And yet, uh, this is something that we're not aware of. All right, and um, this is called uh, the retinal mosaic. Um, it shows you the distribution here of uh, photoreceptors uh, around the center of uh, the fovea. And uh, you see, you can look at the statistics here. So in particular in the center, um, there are fewer blue um, photoreceptors. Good. Um, so that was a reminder um, of um, some elements of the human hardware. Um, do you have any questions? And if you do, I will be curious if, uh, if I can answer them. Any questions? Uh, yeah? Direct. Good. So we've looked a little bit about how things look in um, the human eye. And now um, let's see what happens on uh, the technical implementation side of things. Um, here instead of <laughs> instead of an eye, that's what we see in the camera. So if, if you open it or if you you know uh, cut it through, that's what it looks like. Um, so in order, um, there's a sensor, uh, there's an infrared filter because well the sensor would be able to record infrared, but the point is to make images that. Uh, look similar to what we as humans experience. So this is why there's an IR filter here. Um, and uh, then there is a stack of lenses. And uh, these lenses uh, are usually made from high quality, more or less, uh, more or less high quality plastic um, and just uh, pressed or glued on top of each other. So this entire thing here uh, is rigid. It's uh, a collection of lenses. And uh, then to focus, um, the entire uh, lens stack uh, needs to move relative to the sensor. And uh, we can see here um, there's a little bit of um, 
there is room for a little bit of mechanical play, which allows um, the lens to uh, approach um, or go further from the center. And uh, well, I tried to take pictures of this phenomenon. I tried to take a video on my smartphone, but it didn't work well enough. But so if you take your phone and you look at it, you know, sideways and you switch on your, your camera and then you let it focus on your hand that goes further or, or closer, um, then you might be able to see the lens assembly move a little bit in your smartphone. Um, well, why lenses in the first place? Um, fundamentally, because um, if we did use a pinhole, we would have uh, great, uh, so we would get images that are um, in focus uh, no matter how far, but um, through a pinhole, we only uh, can collect very little light. Uh, so that translates to very noisy images or to exposure times that are too long. And that is why we use lenses and uh, the easiest abstraction of, of the lens, of course, is this. Um, this will give us uh, focus only in a much um, smaller part of the depth range, which often is a desired quality. So um, if you, typically, if you take portraits of pictures, you like the face to be in focus and the remainder to be nicely blurred to, uh, well, uh, to emphasize what you thought was important in this image. Now, the reason I'm showing uh, it here is um, because I'm interested in this conversion from continuous to discrete. Um, so here is, uh, let's say this is uh, the sensor plane here. And then we have on the sensor plane, we have our individual uh, pixels here exaggerated in size. And the thing I wanted to stress is that um, this pixel, uh, it integrates over a finite part of space. And so if you look at, uh, at the pre-image of this uh, pixel here, then this pixel integrates over that, mar that much of the scene. Um, and this is, of, of course, one of the reasons why people want uh, cameras with many pixels. Um, so if the photodiodes tie the sensor plane densely, then uh, what we observe, the discrete image, is actually a, a convolution of the true continuous signal, convolution with, um, well, here I wrote box filter. Um, it would be a box filter if, um, if a pixel captured all the light up to its limit fully and then none of it beyond. That's not exactly what happens. Um, more precisely, um, each pixel has a uh, micro lens on it. And uh, these micro lenses were particularly important in the days when the uh, photodiode um, did not cover all of the space. So here we see um, a more, an older and a newer uh, center. In the older center, this is um, the size uh, of one pixel in the sensing plane, but only this part here is actually uh, sensitive to light. And the rest was just circuitry. Um, so any light impinging here would be lost. And uh, then it could, of course, be interesting to have a micro lens that will um, try and focus everything on that uh, central light sensitive section. Um, there is another uh, twist to this, namely in, the, uh, in these old, more old fashioned sensors. So if this is the sensing plane, you would essentially have a light sensitive element and I'm exaggerating now and then circuitry and another light sensing element and then circuitry and so on. And this means um, that you would really subsample the actual image. And we'll talk about that uh, more after the break. Um, and hence, in, especially with these older kind of sensors, um, aliasing could be a real problem. And uh, 
this is why it was important to match the aperture or to match the optics um, to your sensing device. In particular, um, as you know, if we have um, uh, an aperture which blocks part of the incoming light, um, especially if this aperture becomes very small, um, at some point we um, start observing diffraction. And um, so what we see or the, the point spread function of an object uh, becomes an airy disk. And uh, this airy disk uh, eventually, well, leads to a blur. Um, and that blur had to be large enough. Um, this, uh, the blur by the airy disk had to be large enough um, to make sure that uh, more than one of these um, sensors um, received some of the incoming light. Uh, so especially in, in older digi digital cameras, um, this type of aliasing caused by the light sensitive part not tiling the sensing plane densely is something that can be observed in the images. All right, now if you have an expensive camera, um, you know, a big chunky one, uh, then it will have three sensors, one for red, one for green, one for blue. Uh, in, in smartphones, there's not the, the space for this and then also uh, not the budget often. Um, so what you have is uh, just a single sensing device and uh, then something like the retinal mosaic is being used. Namely, um, you have your single pixels and each pixel has a color filter, uh, a red or a green or a blue filter um, to match what uh, humans uh, see. Um, this uses uh, typically more green than red and blue elements. And now there are many ways to arrange these uh, a famous one is called the Bayer pattern. And the Bayer pattern is uh, um, something that you see here. Um, nowadays, on top of that, um, some of these filters are made brighter and darker, which is uh, what you see in this type of image. And uh, this allows you to take uh, high dynamic range pictures in a single shot um, by uh, you know, the, the very bright parts of the image will be sampled adequately by these, uh, by these kind of pixels. Um, the very dark parts in the image will be sampled more adequately by those uh, sensors here. And uh, then you can combine information from all of them to create an image that shows nuances both in the dark regions and in the bright regions. Good. So the final picture here, left would be real image, uh, right what you would get from a uh, buyer uh, layout. Um, and I mean, the, the individual sensors, they just measure brightness or not. Um, so they just measure what we can think of as gray values, but if you translate it back to colors, then this is uh, the image that the camera really acquires, but that's not what the user wants to see. So we need to go from right to left, and this is a process called demosaicing. And as you see, um, this requires some form of interpolation. So for example, uh, we don't measure the amount of blue. So here there's plenty of blue sky, but we don't measure blue densely, so we need to interpolate in between. And uh, well, this uh, can sometimes, this interpolation can sometimes create uh, artifacts that you can see at the colors, uh, at, the, at the borders where two colors meet. Uh, so these are then typical errors in the demosaicing uh, process that is required. All right.
Any questions? I, I have a... Um, wait, I do 